Smart businesses use data science for growth. Do you know how? Mind Your Data is a podcast that explores how business owners, entrepreneurs, and managers can understand how to be more data-driven. And once you know how, you can use that data science to increase profits, reduce costs, and boost productivity. And now here's the host of Mind Your Data, Kranti Panam. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mind Your Data. On our show today, we have Bethany Finch, who's from American Made Home Solution. I'm looking forward to this conversation to understand a little bit about Bethany's background, how she transitioned into multifamily, and then how, you know, the educational part about credit and financing and things, how she helps everyone, uh, her investors, her vendors, people that she touches along her journey. So Bethany, can you tell us a little bit about your background and we'll go into questions. Sure, Kranti. Thank you so much for having me. I sure appreciate you being here today. Um, I started obviously many, many moons ago as an entrepreneur and through the years um, built several businesses and evolved several businesses. But when we finally landed and said, okay, we need to do something more on the real estate side of things, it was mm -hmm. about 27 years ago. So it was a long time ago and we've learned a lot of things along the way and started in multifamily. In doing so, we um, quickly, my husband worked his way from the ground up as a groundskeeper all the way through mm -hmm. owning 5,000 doors, asset under management, all under full blown construction renovations. And, and uh, he's like, we need to start making this money on our own. So then he's like, okay, you need to launch this real estate thing. You need to figure this out, but I only want you to do single family. And I'm like, what? <laughs> We'd been doing multifamily the whole time. So it felt like a backward step. So I had to be the good wife, right? And um, I either did a great job proving to him mm -hmm. uh, how it didn't make sense or making it look incredibly hard, one or the other, because he <laughs> he did one and he said, can we go back to multifamily? <laughs> so we went back to multifamily and have since expanded multifamily to not just doing renovations, but actual build to rent, which is what a lot of our focus is now is actually doing build to rents. That's great. And I'll, I'll add a point there. And I'll tell you from a husband perspective, he probably thought he he did he didn't want to put you through all the stress that he went through, and maybe thought single family on the other side is going to be a lot lot less complex, more simpler. Hence, you know, you get you don't have to work that hard. So I would I probably understand where he came from from the decision making of oh let's not put her through the same ringer that I went through and not have her stress out. So probably had was a lesson that he learned and then probably you guys came back but you know good for you that you came back you know obviously there's a lot of benefit to go to do multifamily or single family and you know I don't want to bore listeners with all the details but obviously from a scaling standpoint we it does not make much sense once you have this background and experience to basically go back to do single family but tell me yeah. how how the single family experience worked out did it work well or did it not work well what so happened there? I, I built our business. I'm the one that has built all of the businesses and I built our business around um, sustainability. The entire premise and mission of American Made Home Solutions is to create sustainable growth in every single market that we are in. You have to do that with a holistic approach. So you can't just go in and, and think you're going to flip house and then move along. You need to be in that community. You need to be a part of that community You need to expand that community. So on the single family side, uh, we not only were able, I flipped multiple houses, multiple projects, multiple um, units, but then was able to also launch a first time home buyer program and allowed mm -hmm. folks within the community who were already renting some of our other units to put in sweat equity and get involved um, in what we were doing and get, become their, their first home. And it was so rewarding. And then we also saw at that point the, the need for the financial literacy and credit. So many of our contractors had terrible credit because they started their business. All the debt was on their personal side and they didn't know how to get it to the business side. And they didn't understand how credit works. It's completely opposite personal and business. They didn't understand it. So they had to try to apply those principles and it just doesn't work that way. So they just felt disappointed and discouraged. And, and so for us to be able to empower our other team members, right? We had a lot of contractors, a lot of different vendors working with us. We had a lot of um, agents building businesses and to be able to empower them was very exciting. And so expanding the credit side of things was exciting. But then on the single family scale, 
it's so much easier to get a contractor to show up to a 20 unit than it is to get them to show up to one little house. They just aren't right. as big a fan, you know, and it is definitely harder. I was, as a woman, I dealt with a lot of garbage that I shouldn't have had to. I had to fire eight contractors alone off of one project because they thought I was just a stupid little girl who doesn't know anything. And um, now everybody in the, in my team knows if Bethany shows up and she's in coveralls, somebody's probably getting fired because she's going to go take their job. So um, I've learned how to roof. I, I knew a lot of this stuff ahead of time, but they think I didn't know it. And so when I get up there and I show them because a the roofer's telling me, oh, this can't be done in whatever timeline. And I say, oh, yeah, it can. And I'm here to help you. And if it's not, you're fired. <laughs> and then we get up there and we get busy and suddenly they're like, oh, wait, she does know what she's talking about. And so I've had to you know, bust my chops just the same and earn that respect. But it it's um, the lessons there have been very valuable. Right. You learn a oh, lot, yeah. good and bad. <laughs> no, I think and, and I think they're parallel to both single family, multifamily. And I think knowing how construction works, how upgrades work, you know, what you know, when you talk about roofs, how roofs work, I think so important when you're doing bigger deals or you're doing things, because then whatever your contractor is telling, you don't have to go and validate with someone else because you already know and you just don't take things on face value. So I think we agree 100% there. And, you know, I I'd have to commend you on the empowering piece because most people don't have the financial literacy or how credits work. I think that's one of the biggest areas for business owners, you know, entrepreneurs, business owners that they have to build on. And most most places don't actually offer that kind of education. I mean, even when you want to start a business, no one's going to tell you about how to get a credit without using your personal. I mean, I probably no one told me of how to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you once you understand the credit market and you're responsible towards your credit, even if it's business or personal, I think you could make big strides. And that's where leverage comes in. And that's why how that's how powerful uh, multifamily is. So I think uh, agree there with you 100%. And you know, love to hear a lot more about the stories that you've learned with contractors and all this during our conversation. We, we've had the same type of issues, uh, had to fire a few people. But I think at the end of the day, it all comes down to what what was the outcome. So what was the outcome that made you that made your husband say, OK, I think we're good here. Let's just go back to what what we do best. Um, well, so in that space, he finally had one flip that I literally pulled the hands off and said, I'm not doing anything. You have to do it all. I found the deal. I sourced the deal. I did all of that. But then I basically handed it over to him and he thought it was going to be a piece of cake and he wasn't going to have any of the issues. He thought it was a me thing. Right. So once he started realizing the contractors didn't want to show up and all the problems that I had been talking about, he started realizing <laughs> that I wasn't making it up. It was true. Uh, so that's why he's like, no, nah, let's just go back because it's definitely easier. And of course, his contractors that he thought would show up, they're like, Kurt, mm -hmm. I'm not showing up to a single unit. I only do your multifamily stuff. And yeah. so once right. he heard that enough from everybody else, right, it, it made mm -hmm. more sense to him for sure. And I think too, when he realized how much, I mean, it would be, there would be nights I wouldn't even get to come home because like that night, the day that I fired eight contractors off of the one project, mm -hmm. it's a two story. Um, I'm up in the uh, upper part of it. It's 2 a.m. I'm literally bawling my eyes out. I'm so tired. I'm so exhausted. I'm feeling massively defeated, right? As I have fired another contractor and now I know that's one more thing I have to do. And I'm supposed to get on a coaching call and I'm supposed to be um, heading off to a conference. Of course, all of those things already had to be scheduled, right? So you have to decide, are you going to keep the coaching call? Are you going to get on the plane and get going? You've had no sleep, no anything. And everybody at my house is back at home sleeping, having a great time, right? So I had to suck it up, put my big girl pants on and, and get on the call. And thankfully, the coach, best thing they ever said to me, they could tell I was having a tough time. And they said, OK, so Bethany, we're not talking about X, Y, Z, whatever it was I was calling about. She said, we're going to talk about whatever's happening right now. It sounds like you're frustrated. And then she let me explain it. And she goes, OK. And she told me not every project is going to be a home run. 
And you have to yeah. remember that Babe Ruth was a strikeout king just as much as he was a home run king, right? It takes the good and the bad. Both have to happen. So she said 10% of every deal, you're going to bring money to the table. Yeah. Accept it, know it, own it. Stop thinking everything is going to be a win. And I'm, the moment she said that and I really grasped that, totally changed everything for me. Didn't give me any sleep, but I got through, you know, to the conference and made the flight and all of that. So. No, and and I think she nailed it. I mean, as a passive investor myself, when I've invested in many, many deals, and every time you do it, you think you hit a home run when you first put the money. Until you actually get paid, you never know. I've had deals that I, that have had, you know, in Texas markets, in Dallas, and all those gone bad. I mean. There's there's deals that that you would think highest best performing mar markets San Antonio Dallas or Houston or you know you know uh, Austin markets that people have actually not been able to perform that you think that would that had the history of performance but still not are still not able to perform so you know I think it does come with a certain amount of risk that you would go in uh, it's much better than just investing in stocks or companies because you're being protected by the asset. At the end of the day, right. you get something, some residual value, if not, you don't lose the entire thing. But she was 100% right. There's not going to be not every deal is going to be is going to hit. Yeah. And if it's if the percentage is 10%, I'll live with that. You know, if I can get 90% right. of the wins, and you know, lose 10%, you'll just have to live with it. You're 100% yeah. right. So tell us about, you know, what how you're what you're doing with um build to rent this is what everyone's talking about everyone wants to do it uh there's been a lot of stories floating i've invested personally in different funds that are built to rent funds there's a lot of money sitting on the sideline billions of dollars that people want to deploy into it so tell us a little bit about what you are doing in the built to rent space yeah yeah so the great thing is um during 2020 my partners and i um we're Christians. So we sat down and we prayed through, Lord, how can we meet this workforce housing need? All of us mm -hmm. focus on workforce housing and workforce housing is different than affordable housing. And people don't mm -hmm. always understand that it's not luxury and it's not affordable. There is, it's that median, what that average income can afford there. And so mm -hmm. as we focused on that, we um, really just felt continually led to, we need to build them because we couldn't, we already were seeing things turning in the market. We already see deals getting less and less and fewer and fewer and harder and harder. We already heard the whispers of the feds cracking down, changing the rates, which we knew would change everything drastically. So that's what we're seeing, right? Now we're seeing all that. So we saw that back in 2020, because again, all of our team has 25 plus years experience each. Mm -hmm. So we had already been through several market cycles. We knew what was coming and what was, it's historical all the way through. So right. um, when we looked at build to rent, there's many key factors that, again, because of our experience, we had to focus on. So it's not just, you know, what market that market, there has to be very key specific metrics in that market that you need to look at to be aware of. For instance, if they have a rent growth of 3%, oh, that's fantastic. And maybe they've been stable at that for you know 10 years. That's great. But if they have a massive amount of inventory sitting in that market, the last thing you want to be doing is building in that market because you're right. not going to, it's just, your inventory is just going to add to the supply. There's not yeah. as much of a demand. So you have to be paying attention to the attrition rate. You have to pay attention to the um, market growth. You have to pay attention to how many units are coming into the market when your project's looking to possibly end. Um, you have to be looking at affordability, not just is it, is the land inexpensive, but affordability because for instance, the permitting process in my one of my Washington markets in King County, it can take two years to get one permit, two years in my other markets. It can take me two months. Right. Yeah. So the speed of how quickly I can get through makes that more affordable and not affordable because that's time. That's time. I'm holding up contractors. I'm holding up, you know, supplies, all kinds of things. So there's a lot of metrics that we're looking at in each one of those and recognizing, OK, so we have handpicked each of the markets and we are still we still have massive markets that we're constantly looking at and underwriting because our goal is 10,000 doors in the next three years. And that's a pretty hefty goal. It won't that, that all be done. That is a pretty hefty goal. 
<laughs> yeah, it won't all in be the built to rent space. New, well, yes and no. It won't all mm -hmm. be done through ground up construction. Some of it is going to be um, office conversion. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Again, it's right there's a ton of that that's already there, but it's going to take time to convert it. Right. So. Mm -hmm. A little bit faster than new development, but not necessarily. It just depends on the market, right? So yep. we're looking at um, and working out those partnerships and everything now. So, yeah, so we're always looking for funds that are wanting, ready to go with a solid team that has experience. Uh, we already have our um, third project underway. We've got over almost 600 doors um, that have, like the cities are now approaching us. Hey, will you come to this city? And lifting building moratoriums to bring us in because DR Horton is getting such a bad name and a bad rap, which shocks me because Warren Buffett went with DR Horton. So that was quite interesting. So it'll see. But it'll everyone's be going through their own cycle right now. You know, all the builders, yep. you know, there I've had friends who basically had lots that DR Horton took and then probably gave it back, you know, saying we're, we're not, we're not able to, you know, come in now with the current market situation. So there's a lot yeah. of bad rap going around and it's just not one company. I think across the board, bigger companies. Have, oh yeah. Are we just, trouble. we, that's the only one that people recognize, right? Oh, you mean like mm -hmm. DR Horton? It's like, uh, no, we're not like DR Horton. They, we don't even consider them a competitor of ours. <laughs> yeah. No, agreed there. Um, and in terms of, what you're doing for build to rent, what sort of markets are you focused on? I, I heard King County. Where else are you focused on for the Oh, we're so not product? focused in King County. Absolutely not. So okay. Washington State is not landlord friendly. The whole point of build to rent is we want to keep them long term and rent them, right? So right. we are focused on landlord friendly states. Washington State has cracked down more and more and more and more and more um, and making it almost impossible. So we are focused on landlord friendly states. Uh, we've already, we're right now, we're always, we're all along the I-10 corridor in the South. Mm -hmm. So if okay. you're unfamiliar with the I-10, the I-10 runs literally from um, the East coast to the West coast, all the way across the South of America of United States. And so we're basically from Jacksonville to Houston, Texas. Got it. Okay. And, and yeah, then we have some other markets in in key areas like north carolina south carolina georgia alabama you know different places as well the biggest challenge to build to rent that i've heard noticed in you know in markets that were there is the cities sometimes don't like built to rent products because it brings in a lot of renters puts a lot of pressure on the infrastructure for a certain amount of time and then once they leave obviously that drops the the need for the infrastructure how are you overcoming that challenge that is a very good question. I am so thankful you asked that because one of the biggest things that, yes, you're 100% right, infrastructure, right? If we're bringing in 200 and some homes to an area, we need to look at turn lanes. We need to look at fire lanes. We need to look at lights. We need to look at all of that, right? So when cities are actually coming to us, we get them on board and we become a partner with them. So mm -hmm. a lot of times they want to build out their infrastructure, but they've never had the need. So by us coming alongside them, we can partner and we can also get federal grants because of that. And mm -hmm. we're not focused on urban areas. A development project takes, you know, like two to three years. So right. it, in that time, we know that that's about the same speed as the government works. Right. So federal mm -hmm. grants and things like that. So yeah. we are focused on those secondary and sometimes tertiary markets where the growth is going. So right. that we have time to get that infrastructure in place. One of our um, Alabama projects, we've been going back and forth with the city and the state fire marshal about a, a fire truck turnaround lane and different things like this and right of ways. And so recognizing, you know, how we can give to them, but then how they can give back and how we can work it out. And sometimes that meant us going and finding some of the grants mm -hmm. and pointing that in their direction. Um, other right. times it meant, um, us doing something for them. Like one of our projects, we had to build a sewer treatment plant and then we'll maintain it for the first two years. And then after that, we literally hand the keys over to the city. Right. I mean, and you probably get some grants or credits or, you know, tax credits that will basically come in through that process and which is probably very beneficial for anyone is the idea to basically kind of build these communities into and then 
you know, at some point exit this or just keep growing? What, what is the vision that your firm has? So um, we are, our vision is twofold. Um, we always want to keep everything we have, but we also know mm -hmm. that that doesn't always make sense. So we're cherry picking the ones that we're, okay, this one we're taking the long term on. This one will probably sell, you know, and we're cherry picking the ones that we want. Um, if we know, and we're already in talks with several other communities around those same ones, that'll kind of influence whether or not we want to keep that project. It's obviously a lot easier when we have multiple projects within a certain span of each other. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so for us, we are, we are handpicking because we, the plan isn't to, I mean, you can sell as much as you want, but at the end of the day, you're always just going to be creating another job for yourself. And we are trying to create income that's residual for our investors continually. So you do that with longevity and keeping projects. So um, that's what we have just continued to do, as well as we also know we have multiple projects in the pipeline. So it's not hard for us to just roll those into the next deal and into the next deal and, you know, save them so that they're not having to pay taxes and all of that as well. Right. Another question that I had, and it's related to what we do, we do value add multifamily on our end, which has actually gotten tougher with the rates, right? Mm -hmm. with, with where the market's gone from in the last year with, with interest rates. I'm pretty sure that impacts what you are all doing on the BTR space because construction has become very expensive. The cost of services has not come down. The cost of maybe inventory like you know whatever building materials has probably gone down but that has probably compensated with with the increase in the the, the interest rates and the increase in labor costs how are you kind of maneuvering this current market and still moving forward with your plans sure so again that is Probably the best way to say that is having an experienced team makes all the mm -hmm. difference, right? We knew that going, I mean, literally we launched in the middle of COVID. The world's in a pandemic and we're launching something completely new. Who does that, mm -hmm. right? People with experience, people who know. Just like when everybody's jumping ship, who's the last one staying on and why? What's the purpose? Oh, they know something somebody else doesn't, right? So right. Um, in our situation, we were smart. We, bought, we had rate caps. Did we want to pay for that rate cap? No. <laughs> But we also knew the writing on the wall and we had enough okay. history and data backing it up to go, OK, so I, I know nobody likes this rate cap, but we really need to. And that saved us. Right. We also were able to negotiate a lot of the costs. Um, the nice part about when you're doing ground up construction, you don't have to do everything right away today. You mm -hmm. have time and chunks of time in there. So if we don't like some of these bids, well, we can send them back out. And we can sit and wait on it. Okay, wait, this is going to put us through here. Does it make sense for us? Does it make sense for us to wait? Oh, we don't, you know, so we can negotiate in a different way because you don't right. have that speed kind of pushing on you. Um, it also allowed for us to sit and wait, right? If cost gets too exorbitant, we just sit we just and sit. we just wait it right. out because, you know, again, we knew just like when the rates were going up, you know, it can't stay there forever you know, it's got yeah. to do something and you know, it's a matter of when. So we're already seeing it. Third quarter's coming around and then fourth quarter, the feds are going to go, oh no, we haven't spent enough money. You need to get this money back out into the market quickly. I mean, we just know they, they historically it's their pattern. So paying attention to that, watching and waiting, not always refinancing in the height and waiting. And that's the benefit too on build to rent. We have kind of multiple stages so we can refinance in different stages. We aren't locked right. in for a rate for the entire five to seven years. Yeah. And I think once you do a built to rent product, there's a lot of flexibility that a traditional garden style apartment doesn't give you. You could probably take a portion of the community, sell it, or, you know, have investors buy into a certain number of units. And, you know, I've seen across the board different strategies that people have come out to, to do, but I think, you know, you know, the, I think that's where the market's really trending towards is people really want want to get away, have their own homes, have the have a small yard, have want to have that space. And I think that's where a lot of uh, big builders, a lot of movement has kind of gone into the market. One knock that I've heard against build to rent is, oh, this is a this is just for this phase. People are just running towards something that's you know the shiny object syndrome type of thing, 
what is your opinion about it? Do you do you strongly believe that this trend will continue to um, will continue, or you know, do you think they will this will see a headwind in sometime in the future? Well, I think the numbers speak the loudest. I mean, the mm-hmm. feds are saying we have almost a six billion dollar housing inventory shortage. Right. It's a ridiculously high number. If we're not building it, how else are we going to meet that need? So yeah. Yeah. is this the next shiny thing? No, it's the next solution that's been working for quite a while and will continue to work. That's true. And I think, you know, when you look at data and information, when you when you make your decision making, obviously, there's all these factors that go against multifamily as an industry at this point with the interest rates. But I think one factor that really works in, in its favor is the amount of shortage that we have. I mean, that's not and we need we need more homes, we need more inventory, we need everyone's going going to I mean the population is growing. So there's only one way to solve that problem is to build more. And in this high interest rate environment, everyone's kind of pulled back a little bit. And I'm sure that once, like you said, maybe Q four or early Q one next year, once the rates start kind of tapering off a little bit, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more product that's gonna kick off. And you know, yeah. If you're at the forefront of that, I think there's the first more advantage kind of comes in very quickly. So yeah, definitely. Your thoughts, um, any any thoughts on what you're doing on the ho- on the office conversion side? How are you seeing those kind of come out? So um, I I've actually been investigating it for about a year and a half. Because Mm -hmm. as I'm traveling this country, because I'm 100% remote, I see so much of this office space vacant, right? And they're Mm -hmm. phenomenal buildings, but they're vacant. And the the need for a solution is there. And if if the feds is putting pressure on these local and county and city governments to get more housing in there, it's a way that meets that need, but also... um, can sometimes help areas that would otherwise become very um, dilapidated and run down because there's vacancy and that brings in vagrants and things like that. It can totally convert that area into something of value and worthwhile. And so cities are jumping on board with it more so than they ever used to in the past. And I think the type of people that live in that, a lot of them are more of an industrial look, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We call it that that hipster look kind of thing. And people are liking that now. It's, I don't know that you could have pulled it off say even 40 years ago, but I think there's definitely a desire and a fit for that need now. And they like that. It's much more appealing. Yeah. And, you know, and there's many different designs. There's a lot of eclectic buildings that are kind of coming up and people just fall in love with those type of different type of uh, experience that you get at living in those places. And I think it's a matter of how you could start really seeing those conversions. We've seen a lot of hotel conversions happen over the last couple of years. And I think that's something that that really will take off um, to solve this housing crisis. Uh, one one last question on that um, in terms of office, have you started or ha- it's, is it at a phase that you're still investigation, investigating or looking into it? Um, no, we're um, in negotiations. Okay, got it. That, that's, that's helpful to know that there is a group out there that's actually really taking that seriously and i'm sure there's going to be challenges on that front too you know from cities and and, but cities will love it but from internally just the plumbing issues and what it takes to repurpose some of those um, infrastructure challenges that we spoke about is something that you'll have to probably keep in mind and because the our podcast is based on data and information i wanted to touch upon when you start looking at these different avenues how do you look at information you know what what sort of data that you tap into public sources private sources what do you look at to make these decisions like for example the btr concept or the office conversion concept what kind of uh, what sources do you go to well so um i think one of the biggest sources that we go to is um the market first and foremost right so we're mm-hmm. looking at you know simple basic realtor.com right? The, the data that's there from forever. I mean, you can go back like 50 years on that one. Um, the not, not necessarily the chamber of commerce, but the city and local government, you know, Mm -hmm. looking at those permits and how many they've approved and 
looking at their master plan. What's their comprehensive master plan? Looking at the state master plan because the state master plan is always five years out. So we know where they're projecting their growth to. So does that market mm -hmm. fit in with that growth? Looking at um, industry, it's, it's one thing to have, say, a new Amazon center built in that area. But we actually are looking for variety. And so we want to see more than just a new Amazon. We want to see more than just a new FedEx, right? We want to see multiple things popping up, um, maybe a manufacturing as well as a distribution, as well as, um, you know, maybe some smaller scale things coming in. If we if we have an industry that honestly, some of the number one factors I always look at is McDonald's looking to go there? Is Starbucks looking to go there? Is Walmart looking to go there? If any of those three is looking to go there, they've already done way more research than most of the time I need to do. That's usually a very first indicator for me that I'm in, in the right place. Then I start digging into those city, those local city and county government sites to get more of the information I need specific for us. Yeah, I think all of them are great points. And just to add to that, I think diversification of employment, right, that you just said. You never want to be in a, a single employer town where if that company goes bankrupt or belly up, you're basically, you know, you're in trouble. So I think you really want to see some sort of diversification in terms of the employers, the economy, and what drives the, the local markets. But you're right. Anytime you see a Starbucks or a McDonald's in there, I'm sure they've done a lot more research than anyone of us could afford to do or have the resources right. to do. So yeah, Absolutely. all of these are great points. I mean, none of these actually cost any money. Most of them are available and, you know, using the resources that are available, especially talking to the planning, planning departments in the city, you just get a ton of information from them. And most people don't understand they're ready to give you the information, right? The economic development yeah in most cities are actually really helpful in moving forward. Yeah, thank you for, for that. What are some key takeaways? You've been in this for a very, very long time. For a passive investor or a new syndicator, two different pers personas, right? What are your key takeaways to succeed, either in investing as a passively or someone who's starting in syndication? You know, what would you tell them based on your experience? Sure. Um, so like I created a book that's just for passive inventors, investors, 16 questions you need to be asking, right? No mm -hmm. matter who it is, ask these questions. It's so important because it tells a lot. And then I say why you want to ask that question. What does that information reveal to you? And too many times we're not educated on how to pick a good investment. We think it's always about the bottom line, but just like you talked about, sometimes they're not a home run. And sometimes that could be based on the operator. So right. taking the time to ask those extremely important questions as a passive investor and getting that information, it, it, it's worth its weight in gold, right? Anybody can be charming and this and that, but that doesn't mean that they'll have the grit to persevere. Because just like, and even on the syndication side, the big key takeaway there for um, don't just partner with anybody. That is the one and most important thing that we have learned through all the years. When you're partnering with somebody, in multifamily, you're basically married to them for five to right. seven years. So think of it. Did you just jump right in and marry your spouse on the first day? No, you took time to court them and get to know them and ask questions. And just like in marriages, stress and finance, the number two, number one and number two things that cause divorce. That's also the same things that can cause business breakups. So if you right. know, I'll sometimes pick a fight with potential partners just to see how they respond to the stress and see how they handle it or, you know, dive into a little bit deeper with their finances and ask because we may not know that how desperate one particular person is and their desperation could cause issues in a partnership. So taking the time to pick your partners slowly is very, very valuable. And on the passive income side, you know, just recognizing the value and asking more questions than just one or two and getting that information is, is will always be the saving grace. Because at the end of the day, even if a deal, it doesn't make the numbers that you originally thought it would, you still got depreciation all that time. You still gained experience. You still learned from it. There's other things that came along, even if you didn't get a 24% return, but like you said, you got a 10% return. 
you know, it's a base hit, right? It still gets yeah. gets gets the pro the process moving and gets things going, and all the takeaways you get from that, you'll transition to the next one, and it'll just get better and better. No, and both of those are so important, especially if you're a passive investor and you you're looking to work with people. It's very important to really vet them, ask the right questions. It doesn't matter what their history historical performance is. Don't ever take historical performance as indicator for future performance. Obviously, you have to do your due diligence. But at the same time, know that, you know, good operators, once you find good operators, it's always easy to stick with one particular operator and actually keep investing rather than going around um, trying to find new newer operators. That's what I've learned is, you know, I, I, we've, I invest through a you know, handful of people that I trust and, you know, I've done deals with before. So I think to that point, you know, you have to, it takes time to build trust. So you can't really jump into a partnership. Um, and the worst thing you could do in, in a syndicated partnership is it really doesn't help your investors. You actually start losing investors once you start losing partners. The, the firm looks shaky on the outside. You're, you're not going to get people to repeat to, to give you money. So getting that team right at the first time is very, very important. And I think spending time, like you said, is probably key to success. And, it, it, and people react different when they're stressed to when everything is going well, right? You really want to yes. understand that piece that, you know, that's such an important thing. Now and there's going to be stress, right? It's not going to, yeah. it's not going to not happen. There will be stress, not all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> Mind Your Data is brought to you by Four Oaks Capital. Four Oaks Capital is a national real estate investment firm. We specialize in the acquisition, repositioning, and rebranding of workforce multifamily assets. And it's all done through private equity fund structure. Enjoy hassle-free real estate investing with our cloud-based investor portal. The math is simple. Rents come in, expenses are paid, and the rest is profit. Get started today by setting up your investor portal at fouroakscapital.com. Especially like now, you know, when you think about it, I was I was on a call this morning uh, where I invested in a deal and they're doing a capital call. I really wanted to understand what was going on because, you know, why are they doing a, a capital call, which is never a good sign on a deal. But when you think about what happened over the last two or three years, most people didn't see how this forward curve would work, even with rate caps, because they probably bought rate caps bought it for a year didn't buy the second year and now you're going to buy for the second year and it's it, it's through the roof um you never planned you're on underwriting never talked about having a 300,000 rate cap hit or like a 50% increase in insurance costs or property taxes you were assuming everything is going to stay the same everything's changed in the last 2 years in terms of insurance and property taxes how yeah, as the a partner has been crazy. yeah yeah that's i mean Every year it jumps up 20, 25%. And there's no rhyme or reason. It's just the, the general market, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There have been so many factors that have gone wrong. And we keep questioning, is there ever coming back? I say, yeah, yeah, it's it's on the horizon. I don't I don't personally see the, how it's going to come back. When have you ever seen a company go back on its pricing? It just doesn't yeah. do that, right? It Once it knows you're going to pay it, okay, we'll just keep it there. Yeah. The only hope is they don't jump. 20, 25% in a year, year over year. That's just, you know, you can't underwrite to that. I mean, it's very tough to predict right. that kind of jumps when you when you talk about underwriting, but most people never looked at it. So if, you know, in the last two years, if someone did a syndicated deal, you know, unless they, they bought it right, it, it's at a point where things are actually starting to look really shaky for a lot of people, you know, and yeah. especially yeah. With, with all this going on. I know that so, the insurance thing, most people don't realize they have more power than they think. They just assume, well, my insurance rate is going up. We just had a special assessment hit in one of our cities and we have five properties in that city. And they're like, oh, by the way, we're having a city council meeting in regards to this. And basically they're just going to give us this massive hit on this, all of this. And I'm like, um, no. So I have to write a letter. I have to basically go against it, things like that. Mm -hmm. And, and how many other people aren't doing that on insurance? You can appeal it. You don't have to accept whatever they say. Well, the first person you talk to on customer service is almost always, well, I'm sorry, this is just what it is. They don't know yeah. anything. They're just the lackey. But mm -hmm. 
But if you appeal it, you get to the right people. I've talked to VPs of very large insurance companies and gotten things drastically reduced. It, it still went up, but it wasn't like the 50% hike they wanted to give me. Yeah. And recognizing no, I... their, the value there. of Like, look, you can kick back. You don't just have to roll over and take whatever is thrown down your throat, you know? And that's powerful, you know? Not a lot of people... Uh, I don't think anyone realizes that you can even do that. You just think that's handed to you and that's all it is. That's the only option. And uh, because there's probably three, two companies that actually are doing this anymore because everyone else has left town. Um, yeah. Especially yeah. in California where you, we have no options left. So I think you're right. I mean, if, as long as we could maintain, uh, do something about it, cause enough noise or at least ask at a minimum, the worst case you get right. told, no, there's, it doesn't hurt. Yeah. It never hurts. It's always going to be no until you ask. Right. Yeah. No, just that's like very with Zoom. Yeah. Zoom just this last two weeks and their privacy policies. And I'm like, wait, 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 what? You can have all of my proprietary information just because I use your service? Absolutely not. But of course, they didn't care about little old my company, right? Yeah. So I reached out to my brother, who's the one that pointed out to me, and he works for some very large financial institutions. And he said their legal team jumped on it in about five other companies, and they immediately put in huge uproars and zoom now changed their policy. Why? Because people kicked back. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what America is about standing up and saying something, not just sitting down and just doing nothing. Yeah. No. And I think sometimes things that are so fundamental have such value that we, we forget that there's another option to speak up, but thank you for um, pointing that out really want to get into a rapid fire round, which is actually one of my favorite parts of the um, episodes. Uh, love to understand your favorite book. So um, my favorite book is always the book I'm reading. Um, but my favorite, when I think of like, honestly, the one that has been, I've had two that have been pretty impactful. Um, Honestly, my Bible is always the first. It's every day. That's something I'll always read. I always pick that up. But right now, I didn't realize you don't know what you don't know. So I've been reading um, uh, Herb Becker's um, Millionaire Mindset, mm -hmm. not understanding the money model and the money blueprint that I had in basically impregnated on me from a child and how that impacted everything I did later in life. And that's been hugely impactful for me right now. I've never read the book, but I've heard really good things about it. I, I probably yeah. Oh, it's so it. worth it. Yeah, yeah. I've I've read a similar book. It's called The Psychology of Money, which is which was very impactful for me too. And you know, it really started. I moved, got my wheels spinning in the right direction after that one. But thank you. Yeah. I think that's yeah. that's great for all our all our listeners. Is there a favorite ritual that you that you follow? Um, literally starting my day out each morning with. Um, prayer and Bible reading to kind of recenter and refocus. It's easy for us as business owners to just jump in and start our day and just start knocking things off our list. But what mm -hmm. I have found is that life is going to always come at you all day long. So if I don't prioritize the things I want to see done that day and focus on what matters most to me, oftentimes I'm always kind of behind the gun, always just kind of feeling like I'm chasing life instead of me running the race and leading it. That's, you know, I think that's so powerful because that's the first thing you do when you wake up. And I think that puts your mindset in, in a spot that you could actually start. You're a lot more, you know, I should say empathetic to a lot of different things. You're probably, there's a lot of calmness and, um, you know, your decision-making process is so much better once you start your day like that. Is yes, that absolutely. Is there a particular favorite key indicator that you follow either in the markets or, you know, some, some particular thing that you keep an eye out on? It, it's kind of a unique thing, but literacy rate. Yeah, that's interesting. It is. It is. Um, one of our Arkansas markets actually has a 97% literacy rate. That's wow. unheard of. I was yeah. absolutely shocked. So I, I'm like, what's so unique about this place? Why is it so high of a rate? And then when you start diving into that community, you it's like, mm -hmm. okay, okay. So people aren't moving away from the community. It's steadily growing. 
even though jobs aren't necessarily going, it's like, okay, so there's, there's truth to that, right? Educating its citizens makes a huge difference on that community. And so I, believe it or not, I, I do look at that. I don't want to be going into an area that we can't feel like we can make a difference. I, I want to continue to grow on what um, a city or community has already established as important. That is super helpful. I think we've had this question asked many times, and I think this is the first time that anyone has ever said that answer, literacy rate, which is, I think you're right. I mean, just no one thought about it, but it's such an important metric that, you know, that'll give you the impact that you can have on a particular community and based on what your actions you're doing. So thank you. Yeah. That's super helpful. What inspires you on a daily basis? Um, it's different. Some days are just tougher than others, right? So those really, really tough days, um, I literally have a song that I play over and over and over and over again, sometimes to get through that morning to get me where I need to be. Other times it's reminding myself of those families that now own their own home because of us or families that are no longer sleeping next to moldy walls for their babies because we have taken over ownership away from that slumlord. Or um, I try to think of a impact that we've had into a community. And so those days when I'm having the tough day, it's hard to get motivated and get going. I remind myself, this is why we do this. This is why I'm getting up. This is why I'm working even when I'm tired. Uh, and, and I think about the impact and opportunities that we have. Thank you. I think that's very, very powerful in terms of, you know, that not everything we do is about making money, you know, the, and there's only so much that satisfaction that you can get when you, when you actually, you know, have a good exit or make, make some money. But I think what keeps you going on a daily basis are things that are, not related to money, that actually you're making a difference in others' lives. And I think that's what's very, very powerful. Uh, your favorite online tool? My favorite online tool? Um, well, if anybody asks, the answer is usually Bethany doesn't like to be online. <laughs> Um, and it's true. Um, I have this weird electrical thing. So I try to stay off of computers and online and all that as um, much as possible. Um, so let's see my favorite online tool. Um, a lot of people have started saying chat GPT, but if you're not going to be online, I don't, I, I don't honestly chat GPT makes me nervous. I've, I've tried it a couple times. It makes me nervous. Um, I'm a little concerned. It's going to take the place of jobs for people and you know that kind of thing um so for me i would probably say um honestly my um my crm probably because it keeps me it you know it's better than the old days of a rolodex right it reminds me to do things it reminds me to stay on task it um helps me to stay connected when i probably wouldn't um mm -hmm. so i would probably say probably my crm and um, how it's continuing to work and bring balance to my life. <laughs> that's very, that's actually really helpful. If, if the only thing that you're looking at CRM, you're probably raising a lot of money and you're always in front of your investors. So you're doing a lot more deals. So, you know, there you go. And I think that's something that most people can take away instead of looking at Instagram, start looking at your own CRM and see how that's performing. And I think it will make a ton of difference in your own life. Yep. Yeah. I think those those were pretty much the questions from our rapid fire round. Bethany, this was really good talking to you. There were so many good things that came out of the conversation. I particularly enjoyed our conversation and I hope our, our listeners enjoyed it too. I really look forward to having you back on our show at some point later to see how you're doing and how things are going in your businesses and the impact that you're making in others' lives. But thank you again for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Kranti. I appreciate being here. I do hope that there was value there for your listeners. Yep. Thank you.